Well, remember this 56K US Robotics external fax modem I got back in January, and I tested it. It was fine. I had to build my own cable because I didn't have one. I had bought this one on eBay, serial cable, 9 pin for the PC side, 25 pin for the modem side. This was supposed to make life easy because I had to build up my own cable out of DuPont connectors and jamming it in individually, and I thought, let me get the proper cable. Well, you can see I'm at the workbench instead of the computer, so there was a problem. I was trying to test my 33.6 fax modem and my 14.4 fax modem, which no longer says send emails on it, but I wasn't getting a response on the terminal program. So my first thought, I tried the 56K that I know works, using the cable, and that's the only new thing in the system, it didn't work either. And I've already taken apart the other temporary cable, so this is all I had to work with, and I decided to double check the pinouts. And right off the bat, problem. So it may not be clear, but on the 25 pin cable, pin 1 starts on the top left, and then goes straight across, and then starts over on the bottom. It's the opposite for the 9 pin. Pin 1 is on the top right, and it goes to the left, then it goes down to the right on the bottom and continues. So the very first connection is DB9 pin 1 should go to DB25 pin 8. So I'm on pin 1 of DB9, I'm looking for pin 8 on DB25. 1, 2, 3, 4, it goes to four. Five, six, seven, eight. There's nothing on eight. By the way, this is what I was getting at earlier when I said I like a multimeter with continuity mode that's instantly responsive when you touch the pins. No delay of having to hold it for a couple of seconds. Because I can just quickly go along here if I want and see if there's even any continuity on the top row. See, I went quickly along, and I heard a beep somewhere, so I know. It's like a shortcut, because I could also go to the bottom row, and I know there's nothing there. If it was one of those slow responding meters, I'd have to go and linger and linger, and I'm still not sure, did I give it enough time? So this, yep, it's somewhere here, and it's pin 4. So that's wrong. Pin 1 doesn't go to pin 4. So I'm on pin 2 of one connector, it should go to pin 3 on the other. One, two, it's going to two, and not three. And I go along anyway, and it doesn't go anywhere else. So pin two is going to pin two. That's wrong. I can't think of anything that this cable is supposed to be used for. I found another pin that's actually going to multiple pins, not even just one crosswire, so something's totally wrong here. I found a local source, and I'm going to reorder. I looked up the auction for this, it no longer exists. I did get it on eBay in a previous mailbag, but it's currently not listed, so I can't find that. In the meantime, what am I supposed to do? I want to test these modems, so that's why. I've been ordering these DB9 to screw terminal breakout boards. Now I can put this to use. Build my own correct version of this. And that's going to be the first mission for these colorful wires I recently bought. Like I say, good to have stuff around even if you don't really have a purpose when you're buying it. This is what happens. So I'll save you the grief of having to watch this. It's painful enough having to do it. Well, this turned into a proper disaster right quick. First, notice the 14.4 modem has been liberated from its case. So here's the original 56K. Notice on the DB25, it has these threaded sockets where the cable would screw into this. 
Well, this breakout board DB25 has the opposite proper mating pins, but it also had these instead of the screws. So these are going back to back and they won't plug in. So I thought, okay, I'll take these out and just go without. But they're also holding this on. So I've been getting by just holding it and then I can plug it in. So that's fine, but I want to epoxy this down. Here's the setup. I wired it up properly, 9 to 25 pins, put it on the USB to serial interface that I used in the first place in January for the 56K. The 14.4 is not responding. When it powers on, you know, the lights come on, so I believe that's terminal ready and clear to send. That's the way the lights go when these modems are ready. But when I type something in, it just echoes it back, which is something. If there was no power, it would not even echo back. But I do see my characters echo back as I type. It's just not accepting commands. And it's not anything weird in the connections here being all temporary and something might have fallen because I've gone back and forth and this is the one that doesn't respond. So I took it apart to see if there's anything blatantly obvious, and of course there's not. There's no user serviceable parts inside. At least this works. And this works. At least as far as being able to talk to them. I've yet to determine if they can talk over a phone line, but I have two working modems. That's really what I was after. And now I have a spare and a work project. So I was kind of hoping maybe the 33.6 modem would be similar inside and I could do some probing around and compare signals. But when I open this, it's from, there's a copyright on here of 1999 versus 1993 and they really seem to have streamlined it. There's no more chip socket with a programmable chip. The power supply is all over here. I guess this is a regulator similar to this one. It really looks like there's not much we can do if there's nothing obviously visually wrong, like a broken trace that we could replace. Another reason I wanted to take apart the 33.6, this is the set of configuration jumpers I thought were all recessed in. But no, it's, it's perfectly fine. It's just the style. It's got a sloped front. The other one is just straight up. This one's kind of sloped, so it looked like it was knocked in and bent. But it looks fine, and it works fine. So the 33.6 board is copyright 1999 by 3Com. And this one seems to work fine so far as I can test. It responds over the serial port, but the phone line to be determined. So for now I'm going to put the 14.4 aside. I don't really need it working. I've got the 56K and the 33.6K, but if I ever find my chip extractor tool I will try pulling this out and reseating it. So here's my customized serial cable, and I have now epoxied this metal faceplate on so I don't need those screws to hold it and it won't drop every time I unplug it and replug it. So now I can plug it in and it won't interfere with these. No problem. And I turn it on and I get my two LEDs showing it's waiting, it's ready. I'm using the Linux terminal called Minicom. So in order to test the modem, I think if you just type AT on its own and press enter, it will give an OK acknowledgement. So there's AT and it sends back OK. So using the AT commands to make sure the modem is actually alive and able to be intelligent, I can use the ATI, I think that means information, and then three gives a verbose text string describing its identity. And it tells me it's a US Robotics 336 fax modem. And it says OK. So I know this is alive. So now I'll plug in the 56K modem just to double check it. There's the two lights. 
So I type AT and the 56K says OK. I type ATI3 and it says it's a US Robotics 56K fax external. And I'll clear the screen and try the 14.4 modem. With the 14.4, I type AT and nothing comes back. ATI3, nothing comes back. So there is something dreadfully wrong with the 14.4, but I'm just going to have to lay it aside. So, a wall mount old fashioned phone jack, a couple of phone cords bought cheaply at a surplus store. Each one's 12 feet. I'm going to see if I can get a telephone line simulator going. Just something simple, like it's not going to have its own 48 volt negative supply and wait for things to happen and then act like a real phone line. It's just something to create a current loop around 20 milliamps to get the modem to recognize there is a phone circuit and hopefully I can get it to dial out. Trying to make a long story less tedious, I'll put a few links in the description, but in order to simulate a phone line, at least enough to power it so the phones or modems or whatever can actually think that they're on a phone circuit that's off hook and ready to go, I've seen all kinds of details and specifications and circuit implementations. What it simplifies down to is when the phone is on hook, just sitting idle, there's going to be about minus 48 volts across the red and green ring and tip. And when the phone is picked up, so it's off hook, the voltage will drop and it could be, I've seen anywhere from three volts to 12 volts, maybe a little beyond. And there's going to be a current of about 20 to 50 milliamps, according to this reference. 20 milliamps is what I've commonly seen as what you would provide to get a little simulator going. And really, that's it. We just need a power source to give about 20 milliamps to the phone line. And I've seen that implemented all kinds of ways. So if I look through this site, they have a lot of info but we're looking for a simple phone interface. So for a powered circuit, in this case, they throw a 12 volt battery directly in series with the green wire on this phone circuit. And they talk about other stuff, but we're not getting too deep into it. I've also seen implementations where the battery would also have a resistor to limit the current overall to 20 milliamps and it would be across the phone line, not in series with a phone on each end or a modem on each end or whatever. So 12 volts with a resistor across the red and green, and then you connect up one or however many in parallel phones or modems or whatnot. And that kind of makes more sense to me because all the phones on a given circuit in a house or whatever are all in parallel, red to red, green to green and current is coming in from the phone service provider and you just keep going in parallel as many loads as you want to put on. Summarizing this all down, they say that typically, which is a scary word, does that mean it's a rule or not? The ring has a DC potential of minus, say 48 volts, with respect to the tip. So the ring is going to be our more negative. So down here about color code on the wires, we know ring is more negative. The ring is also the red wire. So red is ring and it's negative. So in my circuit, if I have a nine volt battery and a resistor to give me 20 milliamps, if red is the ring and it's negative, then I'm gonna put the negative of my nine volt battery on the red wire, even though it may not likely matter because in this polarity discussion, they talk about originally there might have been a polarity, but then at some point, touch tone phones started including diode bridge rectifiers. And therefore, just like if you have AC going into a bridge rectifier, you get a polarized DC out. Today, or whenever this was written, <laughs> telephone service is essentially immune to the polarity on the line. There may be some special cases, but in general, I don't think it matters, but if I'm going to do any sort of a permanent circuit, 
I'm probably going to keep negative on the ring, which is red. For now, I'm just going to test getting one modem to recognize a phone circuit and try to answer or try to dial out, because I can't do either of those without a phone line so far. It needs to see current on the phone line. So from a 9-volt battery, if I have about 500 ohms or so, I'll get close to a 20 milliamp current source out of this. So here's the 33.6 modem with the makeshift serial cable, and it's powered on and ready to go with the two lights. So without a phone line, if I type ATA to answer the phone line, it immediately just says no carrier. And if I try to dial ATDT for dial touch tone, and then a bunch of numbers, it also goes immediately to say no carrier. Here's the phone cable I have, and a wall mount phone jack that I opened up. So red and green for the ring and tip. I have alligator clips on there. So the two red and green phone wires come over here. I'm already making good use of that 2.1 by 5.5 millimeter plug and jack pair with the screw terminals. Because now I have an application where I have a 9 volt battery, I have a 2.1 by 5.5 plug, but I want it to just have wires on it, so now I do. So one terminal just goes straight to the phone wire. The other 9 volt battery terminal, well, making use of this resistor decade box. I needed one single resistor value really quickly, about 500 ohms, so that on 9 volts I could get just under 20 milliamps. So I put the jumper on 500, 5 times 100 ohm, and everything else is at zero. So this 500 ohm resistor is in series with that other battery terminal, and then it goes on to the phone. So it's a 9 volt battery with a series 500 ohm resistor, and then going to both sides of a phone line. So I have a current meter, and if I short out the phone line terminals with this, it'll complete the circuit, and I can measure the current from the 9 volt with that resistor. So however strong the 9 volt battery is, I don't know, but with this 500 ohm resistor I'm getting just over 17 milliamps. That should be enough to create a presence on the phone line. So I'll take my phone cord and plug it into the jack and into the modem and try again with my simulated phone line. So now with my phone line simulator on the modem phone line, if I type ATA and there should be a presence of a phone line circuit, it should try to answer. And it does! But I escape out because there's nothing to answer. So now if I try to... I'm going to clear the screen. Now if I try to dial A, T, D, T and a bunch of numbers... Success! Phone line simulator! All right. So that's what it took to get the modem sort of working for now. It looks like a mess, but it's the prototyping bench. I mean, look at this serial cable. Ugh. Look at this phone line. At least this works for $9. Once I put it back together and pair it with this other so-called working 56K, the next step is I want to expand on the functionality of this phone line simulator. I'm going to add a whole bunch more features, but in the meantime, if I can get two old PCs up and running side by side, each with their own modem, and put this circuit even just as it is now in between the modems, I should be able to dial out on one and tell the other one to just manually answer. They should connect. I ran a bulletin board system in the early 90s for about four years, so it would be fun to dig out that old software again and see what I can get running. 